I have not made any further progress on the slit neckline sweater. And action. Live from New York, it's show and tell. Hello, I'm Billy. Welcome back. This is a podcast usually about knitting. Today, I'm going to talk about a couple of other things, such as acquisitions that are not yarn related, but because I do a vintage theme here, it has something to do with this sweater. I have a hat that I have shown before, but today I'm going to show you a different accessory that I acquired to specifically go with this sweater. I'm also going to bring you up to date on a couple of projects that I've been working on. You know, I had transitioned from being non-monogamous, having multiple projects on the needles at the same time to being very monogamous for a while where I was completing one project before I would advance to the next one. But then I got involved in doing a couple of things, a knit along, a collaboration with Roxanne Richardson. And I found out that my nephew and his wife were having a baby. So I got involved in doing a baby sweater. So I'm back to having several different things happening, which I think is maybe more interesting for you, but a little bit more of a challenge for me. There are pros and cons to this. I'm sure if you ask a hundred different people, you'll get a hundred different answers. Anyway, you know that sometimes I have guests. There's no guest today, but a common theme of this podcast is that I often talk about travel. And when I have a guest on, I'm always asking them where they're from and to tell us something about their community, a point of interest that if we were visiting, we might not otherwise know of. I wanted to roll back the clock decades, many decades, to when I was a teenager and why this became such a thing for me. So it's a bit of a story. I should probably have some knitting <laughs> to work on, except I'm at an awkward place in each of my projects. So I'll just tell you a little bit of a story here. When I was very young and I started going to the dentist for the first time, I went to the local dentist in our neighborhood. He was an elderly man. His waiting room and his examining room were something that were throwbacks from the Victorian era. The lighting was very dark. The walls were that puce green. My mother probably would have called it monkey vomit green with the old fashioned lamps on a stand. And he had a curio cabinet, sort of like ye old curiosity shop. And sitting on top of that curio cabinet were the three monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. That's when I first learned of them. But there were other interesting things to look at. And I had a couple of cavities. I had more than a couple of cavities as a young child. I still love sweets. And when he would drill my teeth to put fillings in them, I never took Novocaine. He would always have me focus on one of those objects and he developed trust with me by saying, Billy, if it starts to hurt you, just raise your hand and I will stop. And I never needed to raise my hand, but I'm quite certain that if I had, he definitely would have stopped. Anyway, he got old, older and eventually retired. And that's where the travel story sort of begins. I mean, traveling had been a thing in my family and I had done some traveling before my teens, but my very first overseas trip included a visit to Athens, Greece. Now I was doing the grand tour of Europe. Most teenagers backpacking around Europe on a Eurail pass back in the seventies when I did this, may not have gone out of their way to go to Greece, I kind of have to take a ferry over to get there. Anyway, my new dentist was Greek, a younger man. 
And in his waiting room, he had all of these magnificent Greek travel, not just magazines, but books, like the hardbound books like you might find in a hotel room. And he was always encouraging all of his patients to visit his homeland. So when I had decided that I was going to make the grand tour of Europe, he said to me, well, if you go to Athens, you let me know, because I have a woman there who has the key to my apartment overlooking Mount Lecavitos, and you can stay in that apartment. What an offer. What a fabulous offer. So I was traveling with a friend of mine who had been a high school classmate. Now we were both in college. She was studying in Strasbourg, France. And I flew over to, well, first to Paris. And then I took a train to meet up with her in Strasbourg. And every, I guess it was like every Thursday after her last class, we would head out for three or four days to some other destination. So we did find our way to Athens and we stayed in Dr. Tsoukas's apartment. Now, we had not really had access to washing machines or dryers on a lot of our trip. We've been traveling for going on two months at that point. He had a washing machine in his apartment, so we did our wash and we laundered some of our delicates, you know, lingerie, but there was no dryer. So we didn't have unlimited time to wait for these things to dry indoors. He had a terrace and we hung our things over that balcony. The next time I went for a visit for a dental checkup, he said to me, I heard from my neighbors, this was the talk of the town, that you and your friend had your things hanging on the balcony. What did I know? <laughs> now, I don't think I would contemplate doing anything like that. And I have a terrace in Manhattan. I think if somebody came and stayed in my apartment and hung their laundry out on my terrace, I too would be embarrassed. Anyway, I love to travel. I probably love to travel more than I love to knit. And you know how much I love to knit. So I'm hoping that you will comment below and tell me some of your favorite travel destinations. My number one is always Paris. I have been there 16 times and I'm already plotting as soon as my husband and I feel that it's really safe for us to travel again. I'm plotting my next trip because don't forget when I interviewed Matthew Brown, the button, the Art Deco button king. I made up with him that I'm coming to France and I want to see his button collection in person. Now, I don't generally make promises that I'm not going to keep, promises or threats that I'm not going to keep. So I do intend full well to visit Normandy and to pay him a, a call. But I'd love to know what's at the top of your list when you feel comfortable traveling again. I also have been wondering about the yarn festivals. I'd love to go to Edinburgh or Shetland Wool Week. If anybody knows upcoming dates and if anybody's planning to travel from the United States, perhaps we could meet up. I really, really would love to do that because it's a part of the UK where I have not ever been. So while I like to go back to places that are familiar to me, I also love to branch out and find new travel destinations. And there's still so many places where I haven't been. I haven't really told you before that I am a worldwide traveler. I've been on five continents and I think I count 40 or 41 countries so far not too heavy in South America. I've only been to Brazil and then some of the Caribbean destinations, Mexico and some of the islands. 
uh, a lot of my travel has been in Africa and certainly Europe, small bit in Asia as well. My husband and I were invited to a wedding a number of years ago in the Philippines. And I said to him, if we don't go now for this wedding, we'll probably never go there. And to go on our own would be a very different experience than to go with the whole wedding group of people. We were like 40 people and we traveled all around together from venue to venue with local people who knew the roads and so forth. So that was, I think that was my first time in Asia. Um, but on our way home, I mapped out three days for us in Hong Kong. I thought we're in this part of the world, better take advantage of it because you can break up your flights if you stop along your way home, which we did. The last time you were here with me, I was sitting and knitting. I had just cast on this swatch where I was trying out different stitches. I've been called upon to knit a sweater for a new baby in my family. And I was given a picture, which I showed last time, of what my niece wants. And I was trying to get some kind of stitch that resembled the picture of what she's showing me. So I tried a few different things. And I settled on this. Um, I have part of the front and part of the back completed. I really had finished both the front and the back, but when I went to put in the neckline, I wasn't happy with how it was looking. So I ripped back to below where the neckline is. And that's another work in progress for you here. I'm planning on publishing a pattern for this. It's going to be a very, it's going to be a very simple sweater, simple for you, the knitters who purchased the pattern, not so simple for me. I have not really had a lot of experience in designing, so it's touch and go. I have a feeling it's this way for many designers. You might remember that I designed a sweater called Thelma by Countess Furness, which was so complicated I couldn't even imagine writing up a pattern and attempting to have anyone else do it because it was done with diagonal stripes. I wasn't sure if I should knit this way and just knit in the diagonals or if I should knit the panels on the diagonal and piece it together. I had to try many different things and I just don't think it is something that would have mass appeal, but I think this very simple baby sweater possibly will have mass appeal. So that's another thing that I'm working on. I have a lot of balls that I'm juggling at the moment. I'd love to know if you have ever attempted to design anything and comment below, tell us all about it. You can even give a link, although I'm not sure that YouTube allows links, scratch that. If you tell us the name of your pattern and if it's available on Ravelry, people could go there and find it. If you only knit vintage, I'd love to know what some of your favorite patterns are and what you enjoy knitting most, sweaters, scarves. This is an appeal for you to interact with me. I feel like often it's a one-way dialogue. I'm talking to you and you're getting to know me, but I know almost nothing about most of you. So please, I invite you to comment and let's all get to know one another a little better through those comments. I have not made any further progress on the slit neckline sweater that is the sweater that I'm going to do the knit along with Starting May 1st, you too can join me in knitting this 1930s short sleeve sweater with this very interesting neckline. I'll put a picture of it here. I encourage you to check the show notes below for the link of where you go to register for that. 
Good Loops Yarn is offering 15% discount for any of their yarns as much as you want to buy for participants in this knit along. So I am using their Eco Lush, which is a blend of cotton and bamboo. Um, this colorway happens to be called charcoal, but it really has a lot of like a steely blue kind of tone to it, which is perfect for the hat that I intend to wear this with. 40% bamboo viscose, 60% cotton on a two and a half to three millimeter needle. I'm using size three for most of the body. So I encourage you to register for that. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We will meet eight consecutive weeks on Zoom and I'm really prepared to help anybody who has never knit the sweater in pieces before. First of all, to size this up or down accordingly, the sweater pattern only came in one size, 34 inch. So if that's not your size, I will help you to get to your size. And I will also help you with the assembling techniques. It's a little unique, but once you knit and assemble the sweater, you'll be competent to knit any sweater that's knit in pieces. So there's nothing in the round here, which for some of you might be stepping out of your comfort zone, but we'll be a group of people and we'll all be supporting one another. Mostly I'll be helping the people who join the group. So I encourage you to take a look at that and um, sign up now. At the beginning of this episode, I promised to share with you an acquisition. So here is my 1940s Corday handbag. I don't know if you can see, uh, there you might get to see the pattern a little better, how the light fits it. I just love that the handle is this way instead of the conventional way. And it has its original Lucite dangle on it. I purchased this specifically for this sweater to wear with the sweater. I'm not much of a TV watcher, but there is one night of the year that I am riveted. That's for the Oscars, the Academy Awards the most celebrated night of fashion in the United States, except for maybe the Metropolitan Museum, the Met Gala. But for those who were watching this year, you might have noticed that Amy Schumer, who was one of the guest comedian hosts, was wearing a bow knot on her gown. Now her gown was not by Elsa Scaparelli, like I'll put a picture of hers on the screen next to mine. This is just a sweater. She was wearing a full length gown. Her gown was by Oscar de la Renta. I think it's maybe Oscar de la Renta Couture. I'll check that. And put that on the screen. But I wanted to make a comment about this year's Oscars because I've mentioned before that I grew up in Philadelphia. Will Smith is from Philadelphia, as is Bill Cosby. These are the two bad boys of the Oscars. Cosby has the distinction of having been expelled from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. The governing board voted to remove any disgraced star in accordance with the organization's standards of conduct. Will Smith seems to have taken it upon himself to resign. I don't know if it was under pressure from the Academy or not, but it's a sad saga for the bad boys of Philadelphia. 
I wanted to bring you up to date on my gas line situation. The last time I spoke to you, the power company had accidentally severed the gas line coming into my apartment building. They had to shut off the gas in each apartment. There's a valve into everybody's gas stove. When they came into our apartment and they moved our mammoth 1960s, it's an oversized stove, somehow in the moving of it away from the wall to get to the valve, moving it back to put it back in its place, moving it again to turn the valve back on, something went kaflui and gas now leaks out. So when you turn it on, flame isn't just coming out in that ring, but it's shooting out in other places. So they will not turn our gas back on until we either have that stove repaired or replaced. I am going to use this as an opportunity to remodel my entire kitchen. I've had this stove for 45 years. The stove was there before I moved in. The stove has been there since this building was built in 1964. So I think it's time. I am sort of in love with it because it's vintage, but it's yellow. My whole kitchen was yellow when I moved in. And over the years, I painted the cabinets white and made everything black and white, but there's this yellow stove. So I hope someday I'll have a very vintage looking black and white kitchen. In the meantime, without a range, how am I going to cook? Well, we had a double burner hot plate. I'm not sure if our son purchased it or if we had it from many, many years ago when the building had to shut off the gas once before for an extended period of time and they gave everybody hot plates. I'm not sure, but we started cooking on this hot plate. The thought of doing this for the next year until we come up with a kitchen design and hire a contractor and order the appliances and have everything installed. I mean, I'm estimating that that could be a year, a good year from now. The thought of cooking on this hot plate is really not exciting. In general, I don't cook a lot. I'm, I'm not so into it. In New York, it's so easy to bring food in there are places that are open 24 hours a day. Every kind of ethnic food that you could possibly dream of can be delivered right to your door. So there's that factor, but there's also the factor of we tend to eat vegetarian, a lot of things that are raw and fresh don't require cooking. But once in a while, I do like to have my Trader Joe's pizza. So you can see it's gluten-free and it has a cauliflower crust. They tend to run out of these. So when they have them in stock, I buy several at a time. Remember, I'm in a small apartment and you'll laugh at this because I doubt if there's anybody watching this who has a refrigerator like mine. It's a fairly small refrigerator by today's standards, only one door. The freezer is inside of that door. So it's a kakamimi freezer. It's not that good. It doesn't hold that much either. So I had a couple of these and I thought to myself, I'm not going to be able to bake this in the oven. We're looking at a year. So I thought, what am I going to do? I don't want to have this thing hanging out for a year. The freezer is not that good to begin with. It needs to be defrosted every few months. And I wanted to try and cook it and use it up. So what did I do? I'm a knitter. I come up with solutions to problems practically every day with my knitting, right? I took a large frying pan, put the pizza in the pan with, that frying pan doesn't happen to have a lid, but I put another frying pan face to face with it. So this was all sealed inside. And on the hot plate, I cranked it up to the highest temperature, no oven to preheat or anything. I just put it up to the highest setting and let it rip. 
And about 20 minutes later, I took a look at it. A bunch of steam came out. Crispy, fabulous, much better than my oven ever made it. So what do you know about that? And that wraps up another episode of Show and Tell. So signing off, see you next time. Thanks for being here.